I'm Murray McLaughlin, and welcome to this very special edition of Swinging on the Star. Today's show is real special because my special guest is Joni Mitchell. The other special thing is it's awful quiet in here, it's because we got no studio audience, I guess. You know, it must be the flu season, except for Joni's folks, they're out there. You want to clap? There, all three of them, they're out there. And Larry Klein is here, but he's not a studio audience. I would have got around to that. You know? I really would have. <laughs> I mean, there's no sense getting picky about this. I just, you know, I didn't know whether to introduce you right off the top as Mr. and Mrs. Klein because it would give away your secret cover name in hotel rooms. Oh. <laughs> I'll just call you Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. <laughs> anyway, there's nobody here but us. But I'm quite content with that, and I hope you're all real content with that out there in Radio Land. We got our usual band members here, Mr. Danny Greenspoon on the guitar, and Mr. Kip Johnson on the bass. So without further ado, I'm going to do the, the first song uh, because, you know, your songs are like so signature that there is very few of them that an artist of such limited potential as myself could possibly attempt. Oh, God, and he's get away having with. a humble attack. <laughs> yeah, it's really uncharacteristic. <laughs> but I, I really, I, I love this song. I mean, I've heard a lot of people do it and uh, I've always kind of wanted to sing it and I sort of sat down in the last couple of days and learned it. And uh, I'm sure that anyone who's a folk fan will instantly recognize it as one of the great rock and roll hits of all time and uh, about a signature event which occurred in the 1960s when many people descended on New York State to a place called the Asgers Farm. It's a song called Woodstock. Thank you. 
got to get ourselves back to the garden. By the time we got to Woodstock, we will have a million strong. And I dreamed I saw the bombers Riding shotgun in the sky They were turning in a butterflies Above our nation We are stardust Billion year old cob we are golden Cotton the devil's bargain And we've got to get ourselves Back to the garden Well, that was a pretty signature version of Woodstock, I think. Really I mean, nice, it? really good. It's I mean, you're, well, you're the author, jam, and you have so to be—you got to be pretty thrilled, critical. Like, I jammed thing. on that. It's like a red-letter day. <laughs> Do you think, you know, like if if Dave and, and Steve and you know and, and Graham were here, that that you know they'd get mad at us for you know for copping any other licks? I think a big fight would ensue over. No, man, that's the wrong harmony. You see, uh, <laughs> in, in our church, we sang it this way. <laughs> No, man, in our church we sing it this way. Just in case anybody didn't get the, the information off the top of the show because of the usual rambling introduction that I do out of whatever passes for my brain, Mr. Larry Klein and Mrs. Klein are here today, Joni Mitchell, better known as professionally. And uh, why don't we just sort of jump away from the formalities and go straight to you guys playing something together and then we can blab later. Let's start with... Um Cherokee Louise, this is a new song. It's uh, not out yet. I don't, I don't know what your, what your airing time. When's the show February 21st, this thing comes out. It's out. It's out. It's out. It's out. This, is, this is a song off uh, the new album. <laughs> Called Cherokee Louise. Flashlights and batteries We've got cold cuts from the fridge Last year about this time We used to climb up in the branches Just to sway there in some breeze Now the cops on the street They want poor Cherokee Louise People like to talk, towns are wagging over fences, wagging over phones. All their doors are locked, God, she can't even come to our house, but I know where she'll go. To the place where you can stand and press your hands like it was bubble bath in, and I'll smile high as me. The street, my friend, poor Cherokee Louise. Ever since we turned 13, it's like a minefield walking to the door. But when out you get the third degree, and coming in, you get the third world war. 
Tuesday after school we put our pennies on the rails And when the train rolled by We were jumping down like fools Going, look, no heads or tails Go and look, my lucky prize She runs home to her foster dad He opens up a zipper And he yanks her to her knees Oh, please be here, please My friend, poor Cherokee Louise <coughs> They saw That's fine. I think that's part of the end. You want it perfect? We go for it. Well, you know, I mean, some people call that soul. You know, making clams is really good. I mean, unless they're like those kind of, you know. Especially in the chatter. Well, actually, they're not so bad. You know, if you have an F sharp against an F or something, you know, it's not so bad. No, it's I mean, okay, like you do that on purpose. <laughs> yeah, they'll just think Sometimes, it's a weird yeah, chord, right? They think it's art. <laughs> And if you really like put your lip out and refuse to back down, they'll believe it. Yeah, yeah. If you play it twice, it's yours. It's yeah, it's the definition of art. It's like when you browbeat people into believing it. <laughs> so you want us to do another one, or no? Let's gab for a while. Okay. I think gabbing is a good thing I to do, do for a little while. I mean, you know, I, I want you to do another one, so don't put your guitar too far away. No, just put it here. Anything like that. You have an incredible memory for minute events and all of their little colors and textures. I've like, been amazed by your recollection of what people were wearing, what they were eating, who moved where, who had what in their pocket, what kind of shoelaces they were wearing, what they were swearing, what the brand names were, where they left lipstick on the glasses, blah, 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 blah. I mean, for, from events that you're describing that happened like 10 years ago. It's, that's, that's kind of the strong suit of my memory. It's like, uh, it stores, if I've witnessed it, and, and I've been alert, you know, if, if I found it interesting, usually that's the criteria for being awake or asleep, you know. Um, it stores like film, and you can recall it. However, the weak suit is um, um, proper names of anything, names of streets, names of countries, names of heads of state, movie stars, trivial pursuits, that kind of memory is just... You never get the sports questions. No way, you know, that's all gone. Yeah, with me, it's balancing a checkbook. I should live in Tokyo because they don't name the streets over there. You know, they find it all kind of Pathfinder. It's like, if they, if that's why we were like, there this recently, weren't you? Like reasonably recently for a, having a, an art show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you, you've been doing a lot of traveling around the world with your paintings, which I mean, a lot of people know about, but maybe some people don't, that you have gained as much of an international reputation as a, a visual artist. I love that phrase. It sounds so <laughs> toffee nosed. It's star, it's star. I've had these opportunities recently um, to either exhibit or, or to have a show for sale. In Tokyo, I, I sold the work, which in a way I kind of regret, regret, regret because up until then it had no value, really, no monetary value. It, uh, 
A friend of mine had her house appraised, and the guy was walking along, and she collects folk art, and she had a drawing of mine on the wall, and he, the suffragist man stopped in front of it, and he said, Joni Mitchell, the Joni Mitchell, and he nodded his head approvingly and wrote down value nothing. <laughs> Which was perfect, because, you know, at that point you could give the stuff away. Now you can't. If you give, if you give it away now, you have to pay, like, a gift tax on it. It's, uh... In many respects, like, your songwriting career is more like can be more likened to painting, perhaps, than your painting career, because your songwriting career has much more distinct periods, like where that was that, that's over, this is this, that's over. Mm -hmm. In the sense that, like, you have a, probably the greatest dedication to the idea of being, like, you know, jaw-jutting out, iron-willed, boom, you know, <laughs> serious attitude, capital A artist, I mean, to the exclusion of all else. I mean, you're about as iron-assed about it as anybody I've ever met. Would you say that's an adequate, <laughs> an adequate appraisal? Mm, yeah, come on in that, right? That's a compliment, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> no, I know it is. It's sort of the Murray Scottish I version your, of a compliment. Your compliment uh, there. Um, it's, uh, in Japan, this one guy said to me, Ah, oh, Johnny san, uh, how you get so strong willed? Uh, and I, I said, uh, Well, you know, I had a lot of childhood illness. I think that's it. I think that, that had it not been for the undermining of physical strength by a lot of childhood illness, because, you know, I've got a kind of a strong polio, you? body polio. in a certain way. I would have been an athlete. I yeah. probably would have been. And I would not have developed such an inner life. Um, kind of the counter pain, you know, staring, lying on your back in hospitals and staring at knot holes and drips in the walls. And you, you develop a, a kind of a, a, a depth. And I don't mean that as like, I'm deeper than you, man. Or you just naturally, kid, little kids that have had life and death battles develop an old soul quality, you know, and, and an ability to s see through things that people don't generally... You see little cancer victims, and not all of them. Some of them just, you know, go to their death whimpering and whining, you know, but the ones that stand up and face it get a man... You know, like, um, I'm thinking, because on tape I've only seen men children. I haven't seen girls facing that problem, but the little men that I saw in the, in the cancer wards, they were something else. If they kept their spirit up. I learned a lot about spirit with childhood illness and that's where they get the strong jawedness thing. You know, I'm a I'm always saying spirit this and spirit that and keep your spirit up and that spirit and this spirit. Um, you know, I think of that that's spiritual, not has nothing to do with religious. Just I meant more in the sense of being extremely inflexible as far as any outside influence on the direction that you choose to go in at any particular time is concerned, be it oh. management, be it record company, be it friends going, no, no, shriek, don't do it, blah. Oh, yeah, well, you face like, you know, you're always faced with options, right? Creative options, life choice options. And so often your choices are tepid, you know, or dull. And so given an, a, a direction presented to you that interests you, I always follow that, you know, I mean, I, and people have a hard time talking me out of it. They can, they can kind of make my spirit alter, you know, like my enthusiasm for that direction go down. And there's a delicate point where I am swayable um, and I, I can go down and, and examine another point of view. But if mine still, even in the down space, is stronger, bam, I'll follow it, definitely. Mm -hmm. Because strong... Given five tepid options and one kind of crazy idea uh, that, that is, you don't know where it's going to lead, five bad options, you know where they're going, and one that's kind of crazy and you, you're not sure, I'd take the uncertain route every time, yeah. <laughs> You've probably revealed more about yourself through your work than anybody else I've ever met, too. Is that another deal, like, from that kind of uh, courageousness of being, like, when you were a little kid? I, it, it's... To me, that's always been one of the definitions of what an artist is, that they make contact with other people by ripping them themselves open to the extent that they strike a sympathetic chord in somebody who recognizes themselves in what it is that the artist does. And you have an incredibly fanatical uh, group of... I hate to use the word followers. It makes you sound like Reverend Moon. <laughs> but uh, ne never... I don't think have I ever encountered, you know, among people the kind of rabid fascination that some of your fans have. Well, you know, part of the reason for becoming a confessional poet was, okay, let's see if you love me now, huh? You know, I mean, because here you are in this popularity game, uh, you know, and the tradition of the popular artist is to be bigger than life and sexier than anyone and um, real bushy-tailed. What would happen if you weren't? What would happen if you say, look, you know, like, I'm, I'm a bit of a, 
you know, I'm really kind of a mess and I am selfish, you know, like uh, if you begin to expose more and more of your humanness in, in the art of the short story, that's the meat that it's made of. All literature contains real human experience, whereas Pop Arena contains a lot of gloss and nonsense. You know, the question was, could you put those two things together and survive? And then I got to the place where it was all I was capable of. Anyway, nothing mattered to me really but on honesty. And being a loner, isolated by diseases, moving around a lot, I learned somehow or other accumulatively the strength to stand alone. I'm an only child, so the worst that could happen to me would be I was ostracized, and I had been through that many times and lived, you know, you know, either ostracized with disease or um, new kid on the block or um, whatever, mm -hmm. you, you know leaving a gang because the direction that they were headed in was not mine, you know, and once again looking for your people. Uh, there's pros and cons to taking that direction. This one girl, I'll tell you this one story, this is one of my favorite compliments I ever received. Again, the New York attitude. We'd been up jamming all night in this club in New York and, and it was now daylight out on the streets and the idea of like heading out after an all-night session into those streets was like kind of like everybody was really wilted and this little 18 year old girl came up to me and she said Joni I just want to thank you for shaping my morality you know so I said I said well why don't you shape mine and she said no no you asshole all you said was you know I like this and I don't like that and I thought you was right <laughs> <laughs> You want to do another song? Sure. That'd be nice. You don't want to get off too deeply into the meaning of meaning here. Or anything no. Like that. I mean, this is true. It's a gig, you know. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta play.
that's lovely. Oh, that's, thank you. That's just like going for a drive in the car with me dad at night. <laughs> we got a cricket on the track, you know, Did when you? we recorded it. He uh, flew into the studio behind the curtain with the door open. Oh, it wasn't intentional. You didn't buy him in a little cage. And no, no. He flew right into the studio like, like a lucky thing. And so, so we dadded him. <laughs> and stuck him in the fair light and <laughs> gave him the downbeat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Are you going to play something on the piano today? <clears throat> like other than that wonderful job you did accompanying on oh, Woodstock there? I don't remember Do anything on the piano. I hey. bet you if you sat down and played it for a while, you probably would. I could noodle for you, if you like. Noodle? <laughs> just noodle, you know, just a little chordal noodling. Oh, you mean like a work in progress? Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's see if I can remember yeah. that one. A little inventive melody. Write lyrics while you go. I could sing that to those changes, but uh -huh. no, I, I just, I'm real rusty on it, Murray. That's not so. I mean, I think, you know, until you collided with that minor chord, it was the only problem. <laughs> <laughs> was that, that was the only bit that, that kept getting troublesome. Yeah, you. no, that's... I that's, think Bob would have been proud of you. Yeah. You certainly did it better than Bob did the last time I saw him. <laughs> bob <-itis>. mm. There's a standing joke in Canada that L.A. is the fourth largest Canadian city. Yeah, it is. I mean, do you still feel a sense of apartness there? I'm, I'm not a joiner, you know, like I... Uh, um, I think of myself as an international traveler. Um, it's more... I'm not a fan of boundaries, I think, you know, like, I mean, philosophically, where a road goes... This is not a realistic point of view. This is like just an overview where a road goes, where, where a wire goes, where a country line goes, the migration of animals are messed up and, you know, it just causes all sorts of global grief. It's inevitable because, you know, we're so overpopulated and, and lines have to be drawn and territories have to be held. And there's too many people just to be, lead a tribal existence. But um, I feel an affinity and a strong tie to the land that I came off of. Larry and I, last summer, we took a drive from the place I was born, Fort McLeod, Alberta, and up through Saskatchewan in the towns that I lived in. And it's always a thrill. Every time I go there, I mean, 
artists, speaking of artists recharging off their native land, Picasso was an expatriate, I guess, on paper. He lived in Paris, most you know, in France most of his life. But he, every time he went back to Spain, he came back with a new period. There is something about the animal within being on the land that it was born onto in that vicinity that you you cannot that land is always special um, as far as embracing the whole country there's provinces I haven't been to in Canada I know you, you know I'm I'm more aligned with New York City than than I am Halifax I've never been to Halifax so um, what? <laughs> But I feel like a Saskatchewanian, although, oddly enough, they don't stock my records in that province. <laughs> so, you know... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you serious? Like, they don't no, stock your they, records in Saskatchewan? They, well, they don't in Saskatoon. It's always been a kind of a country and western hotbed, you know, and for a while I resembled a country and western singer, and maybe when, when um, I took a jazz band into the Grand Old Opry, that was it for my Saskatoon sales. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a period, just like wham, bam, 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 bam. There's a whole pile of albums where a whole pile of hit records happened. There were short, simple, I mean structurally, to the point, cohesive, um, catchy. And then they, like those kind of songs abruptly stopped. No, they didn't. People's ability to perceive them stopped. They didn't Go on. Stop. Yeah. Um, what happens? There's a. There's a. This is my take on it, anyway. <clears throat> the psychology of a long. The psychology of a long distance runner. Um, the public's attention span has gotten even shorter over over the years. When I entered the game, it was expected that an artist that had something going for them would be developed over a period of five projects. Then it would be their time to die. That's pretty much as long a run as you got, and the struggle was after that. The public attention. For any artist, no matter how compelling, you know, it was at that time about five projects. So if you didn't do, if you recouped on your first album, you would still be kept and nurtured and hopefully you would sell more the next and then the next. Now, it's pretty much reel it up and tear it down. An artist gets, because it's an international market now, now from the beginning, whereas then it was more of a local market, um, it goes very high up the flagpole and then... Uh, it gets torn apart on the second one. The second one can never m seem to match the expectations of the the first. I mean, some people endure a little longer than others, you know, usually through shock value, maintaining some kind of noticeability out of all of it, not necessarily by craft or uh, real talent so much as the ability to, com to be compelling or provocative in some way or other. Um, there's so much material out now. Well, the popular mythology has it that you took an artistic direction where you started writing longer songs, m songs that were much more, for want of a better word, artistically oriented, um, much more descriptive, and that wouldn't really, that didn't fit conventional or popular radio formats anymore. But it seemed well, neither did that help that possibility was, was a matter of choice, really, rather than a matter. Help Me was a hit. The, it was never anything like it. It didn't fit anything conventional. It just so happened mm -hmm. that it was the record company's kind of unanimous decision that they liked that one the best at that time. And at that time, I was still in a period of favor. Mm -hmm. If I was a new artist and released Dog Eat Dog, a new a new personality, if we could kill old Joni off, like and set a, <laughs> set a new puppet, like a new young face up there and put out Dog, out, Dog Eat Dog, I think it would have been responded to entirely differently. But take the normal attention span of an individual. It's not that long. I find it in myself. You know, yeah, everybody compares. If you like the last album, you've got, it's like, you take out a girl, you have a wonderful first date. Oh, you can hardly wait for the second date. Well, it never measures up because your anticipation is greater than anything, you know, imagination is greater than actuality. Know, what always. do you think, Larry? The first one, the first one you locked into. I don't know if I go along. <laughs> Larry, he's an exception. This doesn't pertain to him. <laughs> We're talking about, like, you know. Yeah, I know. We're talking figuratively. Figuratively. But, um... You want to, uh, you know, if you're, uh, like I was going to ask you before whether you were getting uncomfortable in so much as it was sounding dangerously like an interview. Oh, I don't mind. I like talking, you know, about the, the music or anything. You feel like, perish the thought, maybe, oh, I don't know. 
playing something? Oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just heard the thunk as the producer's tastemaker hit the floor. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've got one more worked up. You know, I'm, I'm just so rusty because... Um, and Take also I've got this, Learn like, something new. Oh, you're going to... You're sitting there chain-smoking like a weasel and you're oh, complaining but about your to pipes. Do Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the song you're going to do? Uh, we do Hijiro. Okay. Fever, but I'm so glad to 
It's really, it's really hard, to, you know, to do the right thing for you know our producer and actually get in and after something like that and actually say something. <laughs> I just want to sort of sit there, kind of dumbstruck, with your jaw dropped, going forceps to the stone. Wow, man, <laughs> and stuff like that. Well, I, you know, I waited all of my young life for this moment when I would, you know, actually get to do a duet with Joni Mitchell. I feel suddenly like Julio Iglesias. My time has really come. <laughs> now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get a tan. <laughs> okay. This is, this is a pretty well-known song, so I don't think we even have to say that much about it. What do you think, Bert? That's you. That's you. Oh, Bert. Oh, yeah, I'm looking around Bert. the room. Bert. That's you, Bert. Oh, <laughs> Just call me Ernie of the morning, Ernie. Here we go. Here we go. So we're going to do a... Uh, a song, again, in the all day, all Joni, swinging on a star. Yesterday, a child came out to wonder Caught a dragonfly inside a jar Fearful when the sky was full of thunder And tearful at the falling of a star The seasons they go round and round, and the painted ponies go up and down. We're captive on the carousel of time. We can't return, we can only look behind from where we came and go round and round and round in the circle.
And the seasons, they go round and round And the painted ponies go up and down We're captive on the carousel of time We can't return, we can only look Behind from where we came And go round and round and round In the circle game Sixteen springs and sixteen summers Gone now Cartwheels turn to car wheels through the town. And they tell him, hey, take your time, it won't be long now. Till you drag your heels to slow those circles down. And the seasons, they go round and round, and the painted ponies go up and down. We can only look behind from where we came And go round and round and round in the circle game So the years spin by and now the boy is twenty Though his dreams have lost some grandeur coming true All will be new dreams, maybe better dreams and plenty Before the last revolving year is through Cell of time. We can't return, we can only look behind from where we came and go round and round and round and go round and round and go round and round and go round and round and round in the circle game. Yeah, Maria, I just want to thank you, really, for having me on the show, you know, and, and uh, you know, um, we've been friends a long time, you know, with, with gaps in between. Oh, we always seem, oh, we really seem to kick up like it was yesterday, you know. Yeah, My mom's good. got a, a drawing that Marie did, like, how old you were, what, a teenager or something, hanging on the living room wall, boy with guitar case, have guitar case, will travel, sunset, windmill, pastel, very nice. Romantic vision of myself and one of many <laughs> probable futures. <laughs> no plane in it, you know, not quite that prophetic, but the rest. Well, I've improved a, a lot since then. <laughs> <laughs> I really have. Actually, I should give you one of some something newer. That'd be sort of neat, you know. Well, that does wrap up today's edition of Swinging on a Star. I'd like to thank very much my special guest, Joni Mitchell. Called swinging at us.